So this lecture um, essentially is part two of the rheumatology um, discussion within this module and it follows on from um, part one which looks at osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis uh, in part two I'm going to look at um, basically the other inflammatory arthropathies such as psoriatic arthropathy and reactive arthritis and we're also going to take a look at the spondyloarthropathy um, in particular ankylosing spondylitis and the crystal arthropathy. I've also added in a bit at the end around septic arthritis um, and so we'll look at each of those in turn. Again I've put the terminology slide in, that wasn't the first lecture but it's just to, to re-emphasise that and for you to, to keep being aware of the, the, the appropriateness of the, the terminology. So um, if we just launch in right to condition specific because we've done the, the kind of refresher in terms of normal anatomy and whatnot in the first lecture. Starting with psoriatic arthritis, so we're, we're starting to look at what we essentially call the seronegative arthropathy. Um, even though rheumatoid arthritis can be seronegative, when we refer to seronegative arthropathies, we usually refer to the ones that I'll discuss within this lecture. Um, so psoriatic arthritis is a very heterogeneous inflammatory arthropathy that can have many manifestations. Now, what I'll say from working um, within rheumatology and from experience in working with this patient group is psoriatic arthritis can initially present as quite a benign looking presentation. It can be as simple as a kind of moderately swollen and sore toe, um, you know, that might clinically not look, um, not look very concerning. But I think as podiatrists, because this condition quite often manifests initially in the feet, we, we definitely need to have an awareness of this, um, either for initial diagnosis or for management um, post-diagnosis. So some of the presentations involve peripheral arthritis, and that can be mono, oligo, or poly. Um, with psoriatic arthritis, it's usually a bit more random than rheumatoid arthritis. It is usually asymmetrical, unilateral, and kind of jumps about from joint to joint. Although there is a presentation which is very similar to rheumatoid arthritis, and it's more bilateral and symmetrical you will either in isolation or as part of the overall arthropathy picture <coughs> get enthesitis of the ligaments and tendon either axial or peripheral dactylitis um, of the digit this often actually doesn't respond to traditional DMAR therapy and can be quite difficult to get settled in the feet particularly if that's where the condition initially manifested um, spondylitis which is, refers to axial involvement sacroiliitis and or arthritis mutilans, which is rare, but um, I have seen it in clinical practice, and it represents a, a severe, rapid and destructive form of psoriatic arthritis, and it is clinically um, can be very, very devastating in terms of impact on quality of life and function. Psoriatic arthritis may or may not be associated with dermatological manifestations, i.e. the skin condition psoriasis, or dystrophic nails, coilinicia and onycholysis. Um, 30% of patients with psoriatic arthropathy also have dermatological disease. Um, the onset of psoriatic arthritis usually occurs 10 years after the onset of psoriasis, but 15% of cases can develop before any skin lesions occur or in the absence of skin lesions. Um, there is an association between psoriatic arthritis development and the HLE B27 gene allele, so that human leukocyte antigen system that we spoke about in rheumatoid arthritis, and how that links to your major histocompatibility complex antigen presentation and autoimmunity. Um, the association with this condition is with the HLE B27 gene allele. It is usually rheumatoid factor negative, um, and there is a strong association between this condition and metabolic syndrome. Just looking again at the risk factors, um, and the one thing I want to draw your attention to with psoriatic arthritis is that there is a strong association, um, a strong familial association with this and actually most of the seronegative arthropathy, and then the other things that we've, we've kind of already discussed. So, to understand the pathophysiology, a bit like all of the, the inflammatory um, immune diseases, it is quite complex and there's, there's different components that um, underpin the, the pathophysiology of psoriatic arthritis. Again, this is by no means exhaustive, but this is some of the main components. So, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, we haven't yet identified a bio-trigger for psoriatic arthritis. So, in rheumatoid arthritis, we mean things like rheumatoid factor 
anti-citrullinated peptide autoantibodies in response to citrullinated protein. We know that the, some of the biotriggers for that disease, whereas in psoriatic arthritis that hasn't been identified yet. What we do know is that between HLA B27, there is an association with major histocompatibility complex class 1 protein, and the involvement of those proteins on cell surfaces with um, uh, interaction with the adaptive immune system. So, self antigens um, presented by these proteins, these major histocompatibility complex 1 proteins, attract CD8 T cell, which initiate the autoimmune cascade. So, CD8 plus T cell are a type of lymphocyte, um, which are obviously involved in immune response. This condition is often not associated with autoantibodies, so there can be a lack of autoantibodies and increased volumes of the, the T cells found in synovial fluid, which is the driver largely of this condition. Enthesial trauma may lead to secretion of immune and inflammatory cells, such as cytokine, at the emphasis with altered vascularity, thus inducing emphasitis, hence the connection between psoriatic arthritis, obesity and metabolic syndrome, which do cause <coughs> biomechanical stressors at the emphasis, particularly if we think in the podiatry world around things like um, the Achilles tendon and what truncal obesity does to centre of mass in terms of pulling it forward and the stress that that would have on that tendon, coupled with some of this other stuff, um, can, can be involved in the pathophysiology of psoriatic arthropathy, which is why we often see emphasitis around the, the Achilles tendon and around the retrocalcaneal buster in this condition. Blood levels of osteoclasts are raised, which is responsible for the catabolic bone loss, similar to that of rheumatoid arthritis, where we see erosion of the bone. And cytokines such as IL-22 may be the driver for osteoblastic overproduction. Um, so psoriatic arthritis is both catabolic and hyperostotic. We looked at osteoarthritis, where we've seen the osteophyte hyperproliferative response. We looked at rheumatoid arthritis, where we've seen the erosion, the catabolic um, destructive response. Psoriatic arthritis can basically present with both, both overproduction and destruction of bone. And there's a possible relationship with microbiome in the gut that could potentially be the biotrigger that we've not yet identified in terms of initiating the, the underlying pathophysiology, but more research is needed to confirm um, if this is the case and exactly what the, the microbiome issues um, are in relation to this disease. The diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis can be complex and the evidence shows that there is quite often a delay um, in terms of um, people presenting with initial symptoms and then up until diagnosis. And obviously like the other inflammatory arthropathy we discussed, rheumatoid, the earlier you initiate treatment with this condition, the better. Um, and it can sometimes be years before people are diagnosed. The classification, the CASPER classification, is what is used in clinical practice, and again I'll let you look through that table in, in your own time in terms of how that presents and what the scoring system is. From a podiatry clinical viewpoint, you may be the first to see this condition. Um, you may be the first to notice symptoms that the patients start to present with, or you may be integral in managing disease that's already been diagnosed. Um, so this, the clinical features um, are things like um, distal PIPJ and DIPJ synovitis. So we said that in rheumatoid, the distal interphalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joint by and large are spared. That is not the case in psoriatic arthritis. It does tend to affect the more distal, smaller joints. Um, dactylitis, a key kind of feature of this the disease process, may involve the flexor or extensor tendon joints and collateral ligament emphasis and often don't respond to um, biolog uh, non-biologic DMARD therapy and can be very difficult to settle and is an independent marker for disease activity. So, disease activity. so the presence of dactylitis um, in the toes or in the hands, wherever that presents, can be quite significant and, and often difficult to manage. Dermatological manifestations, which we've spoke about in terms of dystrophic nails and psoriasis, as well as paronychia likely due to enthusial involvement of the long flexor tendons um, and extensor tendons. So, um, multiple possible manifestations and, and challenges with management. If we look at other features, enthesopathy of the Achilles is common, which we mentioned earlier. Enthesial organs are sites of high mechanical stress and commonly include tendon emphasis, periosteal fibrocartilage, um, 
bust in fat and thus the emphasis is a complex structure. Um, that's why we talk about it being an enthesial organ as opposed to just the bit where the tendon goes into the bone. There's a number of different structures um, involved at the emphasis that can all be affected. In psoriatic arthritis, if there is axial involvement, then this leads to the formation of what we call syndesmophytes, which are similar to osteophytes, but we call them syndesmophytes in the spine, at the emphasis of the intervertebral ligament, essentially enthesiophytes. This gradually leads to deformation and fusion of the spine, as these bony proliferations cause fusion of the spinal column. And physiotherapists will use things like the BASTAS score um, in terms of monitoring that, and obviously are integral in terms of trying to prevent some of the destruction and impacts on quality of life associated with axial involvement in terms of keeping people moving, active, strong and functional. How is it different from rheumatoid arthritis? We've been speaking about that throughout this discussion, but ultimately here are some of the differences. So, psoriatic arthritis is associated with the HLA B27 gene allele, whereas rheumatoid is more to do with HLA DR4, and the significance of that is to do with what major histocompatibility complexes they interact with and how they induce the response that they induce in the adaptive immune system. <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis tends to be antibody positive in respect to rheumatoid factor, whereas psoriatic is antibody negative. Psoriatic arthritis tends to be heterogeneous, asymmetrical um, and a bit more random and sporadic, whereas rheumatoid does tend to be bilateral, symmetrical and a polyarthritic presentation. The IPGs are more commonly affected in psoriatic arthritis, whereas the MTPGs are more in rheumatoid. And as we've already said, psoriatic arthritis has more catabolic and hyperostotic features, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is largely catabolic, unless you then get secondary osteoarthritic changes in the joint, which can happen. Imaging, again, very useful as well as our CASPER classifications for diagnosis. Imaging is really useful as well, and for monitoring the disease process post-diagnosis. Um, erosions and enthusiophytes at the IPGs are common. A pencil and cup deformation may present in terms of severe presentation, um, although this isn't um, specific to psoriatic arthritis, and it's where the distal edge of the phalanx erodes. Ankylosis of the IPGs may result, and obviously if it's a more severe presentation, the arthritis mutilins that we discussed earlier, that will show gross bone reabsorption and severe deformation of the digits, either of the foot, the hand, um, almost like as if the digits dissolve in lay terms um, and can be very, very, very destructive. Ultrasound is extremely useful in terms of the diagnosis and management in and around this condition. Um, so what I put up there is a picture of the um, emphasis at the Achilles tendon and it's in a longitudinal plane at the posterior aspect of the lower leg. Um, ultrasound is very good for detecting subclinical disease, which quite often emphasitis can be. Um, and as I said, this can present as quite a benign presentation. Um, so sometimes imaging is good to see actually the severity of what's going on underneath. Um, Tend, in terms of imaging enthesitis, and, and, and this image specifically, we can look for things like tendon thickening and degeneration and involvement of the paratendon if it's the Achilles. Um, calcification of the tendon may also be present in terms of if we start to get things like metaplasia um, occurring whereby cell types change and you start to see calcific deposits within the tendon. Bone irregularity may be seen along the cortex of the bone. You can see the posterior aspect of, of the calcaneus there showing both catabolic breakdown with erosion and hyperostotic um, proliferation with enthesiophyte. Um, paniculitis, if we consider any area of fat pad and emphasis, if it's the Achilles, we consider Kegel's fat pad. Um, you can see inflammation of the actual fat pad and bursitis. We can't see it in this image, there doesn't appear to be a retro calcaneal bursitis but that is something that we could see, or a superficial calcaneal bursitis at this area, um, which can also be part of that um, enthesial organ um, inflammation. <coughs> so the diagnosis and the management of psoriatic arthritis, again, similar to rheumatoid, it's usually done via rheumatology, um, initially anyway, for diagnosis, and then obviously part of that wider multidisciplinary team. Um, it's a, it's a balance and, and an investigation of the clinical picture versus the serology, haematology um, and kind of immunological and medical imaging findings. It's a combination of everything. 
Um, often acute phase reactions, unlike in rheumatoid arthritis, can be normal in psoriatic arthritis, especially if it's largely an enthesial type presentation. And I wrote, can you think why? Um, and ultimately, if we think about the emphasis, you know, and we think about the inflammatory process, cytokines then leave in the blood and go activate um, inflammatory molecules and markers elsewhere in the body. That's that endogenous effect we spoke about when we spoke about rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the things that they endure is the proliferation of CRP and acute inflammation from the liver. At the emphasis, there's a very poor blood supply, and so quite often you do not get the raised serum markers that you will get in other inflammatory conditions. And so that's why subclinical disease and examination of that with medical imaging can be really important, because often clinical picture um, may be very benign unless it's a severe presentation, and blood work can be of limited value. Um, CRP may or may not be raised and you might need to do a high sensitivity CRP which is usually done um, under the care of a consultant. Often a very good response to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, and seronegative and spondyloarthropathies actually is one of the diagnostic criteria is a very good response to NSAIDs. Early management is of course essential and conventional DMARDs, things like methotrexate, um, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, Despite a lack of evidence, they are still used first line quite often, but the evidence shows that they actually don't have much of an impact in terms of the um, halting of this disease process, particularly the halting of axial changes and axial involvement. Um, biologics, anti-TNS or newer types such as ustekinumab are then considered local injections as appropriate. Um, conventional DMARDs do not impact the radiographic progression of non-articular features, so they can have some impact on the articular side of itis, but the non-articular features such as enthesitis, um, axial involvement, syndesmophyte proliferation, they tend not to halt those features. A multidisciplinary team approach is essential with psoriatic arthritis, the same as rheumatoid arthritis or any um, inflammatory autoimmune disease and things like weight management, smoking cessation, all still absolutely important in the management of psoriatic arthritis as well. So that covers us for some of the latest evidence on psoriatic arthritis in terms of cause, pathophysiology. Now I'm going to go and look at reactive arthritis, um, synonymous um, with writer's disease, which is a subtype of reactive arthritis, and that's largely what we're going to look at. So I thought this was quite a useful um, mnemonic to remember um, what writers really involve. And the mnemonic that you use is can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. And that refers to the triad um, of what is involved in writers type reactive arthritis, which is uveitis, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and peripheral arthritis. So the cause of reactive arthritis, again, like most of the seronegative um, arthropathy. There is an association with the HLA B27 gene allele. <coughs> it usually follows um, a genital urinary infection or gastrointestinal infection, and you tend to start getting symptoms two to four weeks post the infection. Acute onset, malaise, fever with asymmetrical, usually lower limb, mono, mono or oligoarthritis. So again, it can be a bit heterogeneous, a bit more sporadic than rheumatoid arthritis and tends to be unilateral and obviously involves quite often the lower limb which is why as podiatrist it's imperative to have an awareness of this. It can be associated with any of the other features of the spondyloarthropathies and the seronegative type diseases i.e. enthesitis, sacroiliitis and or axial involvement um, and lower back pain. Writer's triad which we've, we've discussed um, can occur and the dermatological manifestation associated with this condition is that of keratoderma glenaragicum and that can affect the hands, feet, scrotum and usually the plantar aspect of the hands and the feet. And so again, that's something we really need to be aware of in terms of presentation as podiatrists. And that physically what it looks like, I've put up a few slides just to let you see those kind of thick hyperkeratotic plaques. Um, and so in terms of diagnosis and or management of the, the condition, it's important to have an awareness of that presentation. The diagnosis and management of reactive arthritis or writers is, is really key in terms of the clinical history and obviously in terms of it um, potentially coming from a, an infectious source such as a sexually transmitted disease, um, 
we may need, even need to inquire about things like sex life, especially if it's a younger patient. That can sometimes be a challenge with podiatrists in terms of it's not usually the line of clinical questioning that we would go down, but it's important if you're the person who's seeing the initial presentation of this, particularly if you're working within a rheumatology environment, that you do ask these types of questions um, because gonococcal disease can absolutely um, lead to the, the formation of this condition. Acute phase reactants normally markedly raise, particularly you know, in the acute phase, in the acute presentations of this condition, formation of antibodies in the blood against whatever the infectious antigen is. Leukocytosis, an increase in white blood cells, is very common. Um, and antibiotics may be needed, but usually do not affect the course of the actual arthritis. So you can treat the infection, but that won't necessarily stop if there's going to be an autoimmune flare thereafter. <coughs> The importance, I think, just at this point to say is that the inflammation in the joint caused by reactive arthritis is different to septic arthritis. It isn't a live infection of the joint. It is the, it is the aftermath of a live infection somewhere else that causes the inflammation in the joint and causes a kind of autoimmune response as opposed to septic arthritis, which is a medical emergency, and an active inflammation within a joint. Imaging X-ray ultrasound and MRI can be helpful in similar ways to what was said before about some of the other inflammatory arthropathies, identifying synovitis, joint destruction, tissue damage, etc, etc. It is self-limiting, and normally reactive arthritis will resolve itself within three to six months, although some people do have persistent disease, which lasts longer than a year, and that's where we consider things like the use of DMARDs for prolonged inflammatory arthropathy associated with reactive arthritis. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may retard the formation of syndesmophytes and axial involvement. Oral analgesics may also be used just to manage pain generally, and keratolytics and emollients may be used for dermatological manifestations. We then, because we've spoke about um, kind of axial presentations associated with psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis, we then now are going to go on and look at spondyloarthropathy, spondyloarthropathy um, specifically, which are arthropathies that do affect um, the axial spine. And ankylosing spondylitis is probably one of the more common presentations of these conditions. So what are the spondyloarthropathies? A heterogeneous group of autoimmune diseases involving the axial skeleton. The most common is ankylosing spondylitis. And it's important for us to have an awareness of this as podiatrists because there is peripheral manifestations of this disease, which we're going to go and look at often involving the peripheral MSK system, arthritis, dactylitis and enthesitis, all of which can and do appear in the lower limb. But, like rheumatoid, this can affect the entire body um, systemically with renal, respiratory and cardiovascular complications. Um, essentially, in, in axial involvement and in spondyloarthropathies, um, the gradual progression is to a fused spinal column, often in a, a kind of question mark S shape, which can um, cause that typical um, upper limb or, or upper spine kyphosis and lower limb lordosis and can be a lower spine lordosis, sorry, um, and can be very difficult um, for general day-to-day -day function and quality of life if the deformity is severe and allowed to progress. The male to female ratio of three to one um, and women often have the milder subclinical type disease which often goes up, um, undiagnosed. So males tend to have a, a more significant presentation of spondyloarthropathy type disease and are, are more affected than women. Strong familial and ge genetic predisposition and again linked to HLE B27 like most of the seronegative diseases. This is a disease of young people, it is not an arthritis associated with an, an older age group um, and the onset is usually before the third decade of life. <coughs> and unlike the the pain associated with mechanical back pain, which a lot of our population have, inflammatory back pain usually improves with movement. And it's back, if we think back to the rheumatoid arthritis lecture, I spoke about joint gelling and the, the kind of build up of, of fluid around the joint when we don't move. And that's why morning stiffness, joint gelling happens when we're not moving, and why inflammatory pain can quite often be relieved by rest, particularly inflammatory back pain. Ankylosis spondylitis specifically it, it will involve the axial skeleton and the um, sacroiliac joints. Ankylosis spondylitis, um, as the disease progresses, 
um, neurological manifestations may present due to compression of the nerve. One of the biggest things we need to be aware of, and I'm, I'm always coming back to red flags, is cauda equina syndrome. Um, if that's something you've heard of, great. If it's not, I would encourage you to look that up now, um, because that must be picked up ASAP, particularly if, if it presents in association with this condition. There is a risk of other comorbidities associated with ankylosing spondylitis, and these include cardiovascular incidents and myocardial infarctions and, and various other systemic um, presentations. There can be an association with enteropathic disease, including inflammatory bowel disease, and some evidence, some of the newer evidence, again linked back to, to other seronegative arthropathies like psoriatic, is that there's involvement of the gut microbiome in terms of being the bio-trigger um, for the development. So as well as having the genetic susceptibility, this would be the environmental or bio-trigger that combines with that to then produce the clinical disease process. The pathophysiology, so genetics, HLA, B27 association and involvement of the major histocompatibility um, type 1 um, molecules, and that is to do with your antigen presenting and autoimmunity. Cytokines, um, involvement of IL-23 and IL-17 driving the inflammation associated with ankylosing spondylitis. Association with the ERA1 enzyme, polymorphism, which um, is linked to antigen um, presenting in terms of the proteins around that and so dysfunction of this can obviously cause an autoimmune response. And the pathology has common and shared pathogenic features with psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease. These diseases are all potentially can be linked in, in various ways in terms of the genetic predisposition, um, the environmental triggers or the bio triggers and the, the clinical presentations. <coughs> Like most of the inflammatory arthropathies, diagnosis of um, AS can be difficult and it can be delayed. Um, the British Society for Rheumatology recommends that the modified New York criteria be used to diagnose um, ankylosing spondylitis, and I've outlined the, the criteria there. Blood inflammatory markers may not be elevated. Again, emphasis poor blood supply, they may be, but may not be. Alkaline phosphatase, ALP, is often raised due to bone involvement. So I've written how would you differentiate that from hepatic disease. Well, ALP is raised in both liver disease and in um, disease which involves um, bone turnover. You would differentiate between the clinical picture and also, if it was true liver disease, some of the other liver enzymes, um, such as ALT, GGT, they would tend to also be raised, whereas if it's just ALP, and the clinical picture is suggestive of a more inflammatory presentation like AS, yeah, then that's how you would differentiate. X-rays are often normal for prolonged duration. Um, MRI is a place in diagnosis, particularly for axial changes and early sacroiliac joint involvement in terms of identifying bone edema um, and physio disease. It will pick up both the um, articular and non-articular component. Ultrasound useful for scanning peripheral joints if there is peripheral manifestations in terms of synovitis and enthesitis particularly useful again for us as podiatrists. And patients can be diagnosed on the basis of clinical findings alone with normal imaging. That subtype of women that we spoke about that don't get diagnosed, quite often there is never any axial changes on medical imaging. And so diagnosis will be based on other, other components. The treatment. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are the mainstay of treatment for this condition. As we heard earlier, they can help retard syndesmophyte formation and patients tend to respond very well to the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in these conditions. Anti-TNA, DMARDs may be considered a response to NSAIDs as poor, although we don't actually at the moment have conclusive evidence if these are truly disease modifying in ankylosing spondylitis. That is, this is an area of, of current research. Patients with purely axial disease should not be treated with long-term steroids, obviously because of the, the impact steroids have on bone in terms of osteoporotic fractures, and that's only going to potentially increase the problems axially. Conventional DMARDs may be considered if peripheral arthritis is present, but evidence suggests they will not halt spinal progression. Physiotherapy and exercises are of paramount importance. Um, oral analgesics and management of other features, i.e. peripheral and systemic features, smoking cessation and weight management, and podiatric MSK interventions as appropriate, whether that be um, basic lifestyle advice, exercise therapy at an appropriate level, depending on um, presence of inflammation or not, orthotics, 
steroid injections, whatever that might look like in terms of your podiatric practice. And that largely covers the, the, the seronegative arthropathies that I wanted to go through as part of this discussion. The next slides are going to be in and around um, the crystal arthropathies, including gout and pseudo gout. <coughs> Obviously, podiatrists, most of us will be familiar with gout, which is an arthritis caused by an influx of monosodium urate crystals within a joint, which cause inflammation and eventual tissue damage. Um, again, um, like some of the other inflammatory arthropathies, we have intra-articular effects and we have potential extra-articular effects, either directly or indirectly with the tendon. By that, I mean the gout can affect the tendon directly or because of the disruption in the joint, it can affect the structure passing in and around the joint indirectly. The most common area affected in gout is the first MCPJ, and if it's that in isolation, we can term it podagra. The magnitude and duration of the hyperuricemia, high gout levels, <coughs> is directly correlated with the likelihood of people developing gout. Um, so basically, the longer you have high levels of uric acid in your blood, the more likely you'll get gout. Although, some people do have hyperuricemia and never develop gout, and some people don't have hyperuricemia and do develop gout, so it's not entirely diagnostic. The risk factors for gout are things like renal disease, um, impaired renal excretion of uric acid and therefore you get a build up, overproduction of uric acid, um, both, alcohol because it competes for renal excretion with uric acid and so the levels of uric acid build, and a diet high in purine rich foods, that's why it was always called the rich man's disease. Obesity, hypertension and cardiovascular disease because they're all associated with um, all the other things that we spoke about in terms of that patient that may consume more alcohol, they may not have 100% um, kidney function. Um, so, so that is, is how they are associated. Diabetes mellitus, again that links to metabolic syndrome as well, so it's all part of that circle of diseases. Um, chronic kidney disease, diuretic medication, thyroid diuretic and chemotherapy. Um, protective foods are things like dairy, coffee and vitamin C, although what is important to note is that too much fructose from things like fruit juice and whatnot can cause gout. So it depends where you get your, your source of vitamin C. The presentation of gout is really quite specific. It's one of it's a very, very specific um, clinical presentation. Excruciating pain with rapid onset, usually less than 24 hours to maximal pain. Um, lots of erythema, um, lots of uh, temperature increase and lots of edema around the joint. Red, hot, swollen, very painful, agony to even like cut salad in here. Um, potentially fever, malaise. Um, toe five, particularly if it's associated with chronic tophaceous gout in and around the joint. And atypical, so it affects on the, the bursa, the tendon, and, and cellulitis. Five possible presentations of gout. Acute gout um, with intercritical phases. So the intercritical phases are where the acute swelling, inflammation, and attack um, suppresses. Chronic interval gout, acute phases with low, with low grade inflammation throughout and general joint damage. Chronic polyarticular gout, this is rare and it's largely seen with renal, renal failure and long term use of diuretic or if allopurinol is started during an acute attack. And we're going to look at that now in the next couple of slides about why you shouldn't start these medications during an acute attack. Chronic tophaceous gout, toe five, in and around the joint and tendon. Um, which may cause ulceration and breakdown of the overlying tissues and urate renal stone. <clears throat> so the pathophysiology of gout, essentially it starts with an overproduction or an under secretion of uric acid levels which ultimately may lead to hyperuricemia. Interleukin-1, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, plays an essential role in mediating gouty inflammation, so that can be the driver in this disease, and I spoke about that earlier in terms of the different inflammatory arthropathies having different drivers, and even different patients with the same inflammatory arthropathies having different drivers of the inflammation. Monosodium urate crystals directly activate NLRP3, um, and basically that is an inflammasome, and they, they activate that through multiple potential mechanisms, and that's part of that inflammation cascade. Monosodium urate crystals release into the synovial fluid, engage tone-like receptors on the surface of macrophages, leading to activation, so again, part of that, inducing that inflammatory response. After monosodium urate crystals are phagocytosed, 
Phago lysosomes are destabilised, generating reactive oxygen um, species and decreased systolic potassium levels. These events activate NLRP3 inflammasomes, including activation of pro-caspase 1 to caspase 1. That then cleaves pro interleukin 1 to create a more mature form, and the active IL-1 is then secreted, resulting in the inflammatory response, which can further activate um, phagocytes. So that's really how the monosodium urate crystals result in the production of the IL-1, which drives the inflammation associated with gout. The diagnosis, because gout is a, essentially a red hot swollen joint, it is a potential medical emergency until you know otherwise. So unless you are absolutely certain of the diagnosis based on history presentation, if it is a new acute presentation, of a red hot swollen joint, then you absolutely have to arrange or carry out yourself arthrocentesis to extract the synovial fluid from the joint and examine that um, to see if, if it is truly gout. Clinical history and signs and symptoms, obviously we've discussed what they look like. Full blood count to rule out any other conditioning. The big one, the medical emergency really that we'll constantly come back to is septic arthritis. So, Things like um, leukocytosis, look at the white blood cells, they will also give you a clue as to what's going on. In terms of, if the neutrophils are sky high, you, then you suspect a bacterial infection. Um, <coughs> blood vessels of hyperuricemia, limited in acute flares, because normally all the uric acid is in the joint, and your serum levels can quite often be normal in acute attacks. Renal function, look at the EGFR, because that's directly linked with gout. Rule out other differential diagnostics, and that's part of what we've just been kind of speaking about in terms of some of the tests that you might do. So to treat gout, it's different in different stages. Obviously, you need to manage the inflammation, manage the uric acid levels as a preventative measure, manage pain throughout whatever stage of the disease, whether it's associated with an acute flare and or persisting joint damage, manage other associated conditions, and prevention. So. Corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or colchicine, if, if the patient can't take non-steroidal, are useful in acute attacks. So that's the bit about controlling the inflammation. You need to do that first before you initiate um, xanthine oxidase inhibitors or uricosurics to actually control the hyperuricemia. Once you get the inflammation under control, usually first line is allopurinol, which inhibits the enzyme xanthine oxidase, which is involved in uric acid production. You can also use fibuxostat, which um, also inhibits xanthine oxidase if allopurinol is contraindicated. The other option you have with the management of gout is uricosuric, such as sulfonpyrazone, which improves the renal excretion um, of uric acid. If it's severe and it's not responding to these types of presentations, new evidence does support the use of things like canakinumab, which is a monoclonal antibody which inhibits IL-1, which we've said drives the inflammation in gout. So as a biologic, well, potentially more side effects, but it is an option in severe unremitting um, kind of cases. Corticosteroids, either injection or oral, analgesics, and lifestyle modification. Steroids may be the first line to manage acute flares. Obviously, we can't use steroids regularly, but we can use them as one-off and just being aware of the associated risks. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are usually the drug of choice in terms of managing the inflammation, but again, they're often contraindicated um, if you've got things like um, gastrointestinal effects or if it's a specific COX-2 inhibitor, the cardiovascular risk, if, if they've already got a patient with um, presenting cardiovascular risk, then that may not be an option, so colcitrine may be considered. Um, and this basically inhibits the activation and migration of neutrophils and so reduces the inflammation. <coughs> So we spoke already about allopurinol and the uricosuric. Um, that's the two options you have, really, in terms of controlling your hyperuricemia. In rare cases, allopurinol may cause allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome, um, and fibuxostat can be an option in severe renal and hepatic impairment. It has less impact in that respect. The other pharmacological options you've got in, in gout, which are used less often, but um, are, are option, um, Paglotokase, which is IV therapy to lower uric acid levels, but it's, a, it's associated with allergic reactions, and so obviously often pre-medication is needed with antihistamines and steroids, and so it limits its ease of use. Um, Lysinurad, 
That can be combined with xanthine oxide, oxidase inhibitors like allopurinol and fibuxostat. That inhibits the OAT4 transporter that is implicated with high levels of uric acid from use of certain diuretics. So that potentially somebody's on um, diuretics and that's the driver, then this can be considered um, to, to manage that underlying pathophysiology. And IL-1 inhibitors, what we've already said, canakinimab, IL-1 is linked to the inflammatory response associated with gout. So we can, we can really kind of use more, um, more complex um, pharmacological options like biologics to, to manage unremitting cases. So that's gout. We will also look at pseudo-gout in the context of this discussion, which is um, shortened to CPPD, calcium pyrophosphate disease. And basically CPPD is an umbrella term covering various presentations of this disease. It can be asymptomatic, just picked up as chondrocalcinosis, which I had an image of earlier on X-ray, where the, the crystals kind of form along the line of the, the articular cartilage. Osteoarthritis and CPPD affecting the same joint, often the, the hand, which is things like what we showed earlier, um, Heberman's node, Butcher's node. Um, but there is, whilst there is an association between CPPD and OA, it's not um, associated with hip OA or distal joint OA, um, so it is joint specific. Acute CPPD arthritis, similar to gout but less than 10, mono to oligo presentation often involves a bigger joint like one knee, and chronic CPPD arthritis, chronic inflammation more widespread and can cause um, a neuropathic joint um, destruction, a neuropathic osteoarthropathy, a bit like charcoal as well, but it can happen. Etiology, most common in the elderly and those with osteoarthritis, Autosomal inheritance, polymorphism of the ANKH, ankylosing human gene. This is rare, but it can be a cause of CPPD. And then all of the risk factors that I've outlined, that I'll let you read through, um, can be associated with the onset of CPPD. The pathophysiology of, of this disease is <coughs> around the high levels of extracellular PPI, or EPPI for, for short, which is an inorganic phosphate in the synovium of CPPD joint due to ATP breakdown or other factors um, associated with the action of ANKH gene. For these crystals to form, the calcium pyrophosphate crystals to form, they need extracellular um, EPPI. Whether the crystals form in the presence of EPPI um, will depend on mechanical loading, metabolic activity, cell division and injury. So the, pre the presence of this inorganic phosphate alone won't trigger the formation. There has to be other things involved. Once the crystals are formed, they then activate inflammasomes um, and cytokines and neutrophils to induce the inflammation within the joint space. Um, so that's how CPPD, um, the underlying path pathophysiology, works. The diagnosis is basically the only way to truly diagnose it is joint fluid examination, so atherosynthesis for CPP crystals, um, which are less identifiable than monosodium urea crystals, but with appropriate training in the right person, they can be identified. X-ray, really of limited value in acute presentation, although may show chondrocalcinosis, which is that kind of sclerotic bright line across um, the bone there. Ultrasound can detect... Um, CPPD crystal deposition, a bit like in gout where you've got the double contours sign and the, the deposition of the crystals along the, the articular cartilage. Um, clinical presentation and investigation for associated conditions like osteoarthritis, metabolic disorders and genetic testing, the ANK gene that we spoke about might be um, prudent if the diagnosis is a bit more difficult. So poor evidence-based surrounds the management of this condition. Um, unlike gout, there are no pharmacological methods of lowering um, the, the levels of, of CPP crystals. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and colchicine can be used to control some of the inflammation. Steroids or adrenocorticotrophic releasing hormone injection to induce the production of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal steroid production. Um, analgesics just to control pain generally and DMARD, rarely used. Anakinra can be used, which is an IL-1 antagonist. That brings me on to the last part of my talk, because I think it's important to mention septic arthritis in the context of what we've been talking about, because it is an important differential diagnosis in terms of ruling out red flags and in inflammatory arthropathy. 
um, and you can see from there, maybe that's what I've kind of identified right away, is that septic arthritis um, is indeed a, a clinical red flag. It's something that if you are suspecting this, then you need to respond on an ASAP basis. <clears throat> Septic arthritis is an intra-articular infection which can result in destructive arthropathy, most commonly associated with staph aureus and maybe associated with an STI, like gonorrhea. Um, it presents as an acute monoarthritis, usually one red, hot, swollen and painful joint, and it's usually in joints that have a good blood supply, which is how the bacteria or the antigen or pathogen gets to the joint in the first place. Um, a cap there's usually a capsular pattern of joint restriction because it's intra-articularly that the pathogenesis is occurring. Elevated ESR, CRP and leukocytosis, particularly neutrophils, as it is a bacterial infection, and possible signs of systemic malaise, um, especially if the infection is spreading. So if there is things like fever, nausea, rigor, um, pyrexia, however that might look, leukocytosis, or even leukopenia in severe, severe um, presentations of infection, then that's something that um, should ring your alarm bells as a clinician and that's an urgent admission or, um, to a &E. Risk factors for septic arthritis include things like IV drug abuse, unprotected sex, wounds, prosthetic joint, poor health status and other diseases, and intra-articular procedures. In terms of the diagnosis, the gold standard, standard um, is arthrocentesis. If you are in any doubt about what the presentation of a red hot swollen joint is indicating, that must be done. Um, again, looking at white blood cells, acute phase reactant, x-ray certainly in the acute phase is of limited value, MRI would be gold standard. Um, <coughs> clinical signs and history, asked about trauma, procedure, medical status, sex life, um, and differential diagnosis, basically everything that we've been speaking about in terms of the other inflammatory or non-inflammatory presentation. The management, I put a table in which you can, you can look through. Local guidelines will really direct management with this in terms of what board you work with or um, whatever your practice is. But ultimately, it's um, long-term antibiotic therapy, usually intravenously initially for several weeks until the vital signs are controlled and then it will move on to oral antibiotics um, in, in the second phase of treatment. I haven't went into these um, disorders in detail because I think that's quite a lot of discussion we've had in terms of um, the rheumatology conditions that we've looked at, but I have put in just basic links, although please feel free to do further reading, around some of the connective tissue diseases which we didn't really look at. Um, obviously rheumatology is it's a, a clinical area of over 250 um, immunological and inflammatory conditions, so it's impossible to, to go through them all, but please feel free to have a look at these links for some of the main connective tissue presentations that you might see. Um, in terms of just clinical practice, um, one of the most important things in rheumatology and in NSK generally, as we'll know, is about the look, feel, move, listen principles in terms of what are you seeing and what is that telling you. I've put in helpful tools, I, I gave these as pre reading as well in terms of helping you within clinical practice. And you've got the GALS assessment, gait, arms and legs, which is a kind of generic um, MSK assessment. You've got a more specific REMS assessment, regional examination, which will go into some detail on the foot and ankle, although um, as podiatrists we will naturally need to, to read around that area more. And the PGALS assessment, which is a paediatric version, and the aim is often really in these conditions to differentiate inflammatory pathology from other causes, mechanical, vascular, neurological, chronic pain, one-off trauma. Um, more than, obviously more than one presentation of these could be present in one individual, but it's about how to differentiate that and really, really importantly knowing about the red flags like septic arthritis and how to identify and manage those as part of that multidisciplinary team. Again, I've put in the references for part two of this discussion on the seronegative arthropathies and the crystal arthropathies and, and, and septic arthritis. So please feel free to go into those if you would like some more detail. Thank you.